Welcome to Keep IT Healthy Podcast, a show hosted by people making things happen in technology, aiming to optimize healthcare delivery, health, well-being, and fitness. My name is Jan Kaminski and I'm the co-founder of AppLover, a company dedicated to improving the quality of life with IT solutions and digital advisory. We started making this podcast to amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. Our guest today is Jin Gurkov, founder and CEO of Charity Miles. Hi. Hello, how's it going? Thanks, Jan. Um, we always start with this uh, question um, with our guests uh, because we want to know the backstory. And um, could you tell us your backstory and what brought you to this particular career path? Sure. So uh, my name is Gene Gurkoff. I'm the founder of Charity Miles. And for those that don't know, Charity Miles is an app that allows people to earn money for charity whenever they walk, run, or bike. I started this 11 years ago, which is crazy to me that I started something 11 years ago and I'm still doing it. Um, and the idea came from um, kind of my background where my grandfather had Parkinson's disease. And when I was in law school 20 years ago, I started running marathons to raise money for Parkinson's research. Um, and when I graduated law school, I started to get involved with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's research as like a pro bono attorney. Um, and at the law firm I was at, because I was doing work for the Fox Foundation, I also started to do work at other charities. And then, you know, iPhones came out. And everyone was talking about apps, and I just had an idea to make an app that could take all the people like me who are out there walking and running and biking for charity and help us earn money for charity um, and kind of put the, together like the background that I had in the running and the background I had working with the charities, and it all kind of came together in like a thunderbolt moment, and I've been doing it ever since. So I started this honor on my grandfather, but, um, you know that kind of only carries you so far. And like a lot of times as like a founder, and this is probably why you start with this question, like you're always asked about your backstories, if it's like kind of like the superhero um, founder, like creation story, like how, how did Batman become Batman or whatever, which I think is not really like how I see like the Charity Miles journey. The thing that really drives Charity Miles isn't like my backstory at all. It's all of our members. And the thing that fires me up most is getting to getting to talk about and me and hear, hear from all the amazing people in our community because they're the ones that are really driving this train. We've had eight people walk or run across the United States with charity miles. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've come close to quitting a thousand times. And, you know, if it was just my grandfather's story, then I probably would have quit. And I love my grandfather. But the thing that really that keeps me going, that keeps charity miles going, is our community and the amazing things that our members are doing every day. But at the beginning, you mentioned your career as an attorney, and I know you worked as an associate for uh, for various companies mm -hmm. after your, uh, obtaining your uh, diploma from Harvard Law School, by the way, yep. which sounds impressive already. How did your legal background shape the way and your work um, at Charity Miles? I guess I, I still get to practice my skills as a lawyer, like when I'm from reviewing contracts or whatever. But, you know, I kind of always wanted to be an entrepreneur, like my grandfather, who I started Charity Miles in honor of. He was a lawyer and, a business, and then became a business person. That's kind of always what I wanted to do for myself. And, um, you know, just getting, I guess, because, like I said, I was working with a lot of charities at the law firm that I worked for. So, I got to do a lot of pro bono work. That was one of the great things about working for such great law firms is that we had really great pro bono work to do. And in addition to all the great legal work that we did and um, you know, the, the charities that I was working for, I just got to meet these amazing organizations and develop relationships with them. So that when I had the idea for charity miles and it was kind of like, a, it was a out there idea. So, you know, when I went to them and asked them if they wanted to be a part of it, you know, they said yes. And had I not had that relationship with them, they probably wouldn't have said yes, because these charities get people coming to them all the time with different ideas that they, they just can't, they don't have the resources and the bandwidth to pay attention to that. So had I not had the relationship and the trust with them, then they probably wouldn't have said yes. And I wouldn't have been able to get Charity Mall started. So actually law, law firms became like first clients in a sense? Or no, charities that I was doing pro bono work for. So oh, okay. charities like I was doing pro bono work for, obviously, for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, for Habitat for Humanity, okay. other charities. So like 
that gave me some relationships with them to, so when I had this idea, I could reach out to those people and hear and ask if they thought it was a good idea. So it was kind of like my um, initial audience to like, see like, is this an idea worth pursuing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they were enthusiastic about it, that's how I started down the road. But you don't miss the legal career. I do. I love being a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I miss, every day I, I miss it. Um, I thought it was great to be a lawyer. I worked at great law firms. The work was great. And, um, and yeah, I'm, there's many days when I miss mm -hmm. it. Okay. But w w with Charity Miles, you're supporting over 30 charities, uh, 37 to be exact, I think. How do you decide which charities to partner with? Like, w what are the key criteria for that? That's a good question. We actually, so when I started it, my criteria was, well, did I have a relationship with the charity so that I knew who to talk to? But I really wanted to make sure that I was very purposeful about the charities that we brought in so that they were not only reputable charities, but that they were brand charities that everybody would recognize. So that if you downloaded it in New Jersey or New York or Finland or wherever, that you would recognize the brands of these charities and that it would make sense for you. You would feel good about walking for them. And the original idea was to have a small, relatively small number of charities in the app. And then we would go out and we would get corporate sponsors to advertise in the app. And that would be where the money came from for the charities. Um, but the number one feedback that we get from people is that they always want their favorite charity added to the app. And every day charities are reaching out to us because they want to be in the app. And I would love to be able to support most of them. Um, you know, we do have some criteria about, you know, the types of things that we would or would not support. But, um, you know, the, the, the roadblock for us was always that we never had enough money from our corporate sponsors to be able to support all the charities that we wanted to join us. So we started to think about other things that we could do with our platform so that we would be able to make an impact or help charities that wanted to join us make an impact for themselves. And so now like our main criteria for adding a charity is really whether or not we can be helpful for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a charity reaches out and wants to join us, we have a call with them where we just explain to them what the things that we're good at and the things that we're not good at, and they can decide whether or not that would be helpful for them. Um, mm -hmm. And then we just actually also added a, a new feature. This is about two weeks old um, with the PayPal giving fund. So the PayPal giving fund is a, is a donor advised fund, which is part of PayPal, which basically has like hundreds of thousands of charities enrolled in it. And we created an integration through their API so that people can come into charity miles and select any of the enrolled charities and the PayPal giving fund from U S and Canada. And then we're also going to do Europe as well. So that opens it up so that people can use charity miles to fundraise for any of the enrolled charities in the PayPal giving fund, which is a big step for us because it allow gives people the ability to support all of their favorite charities. And then if those charities want to actually partner with us and get, access to all the other things that we can do to, to help them, then they can reach out to us. I mean, you covered some of it, but obviously it started as a platform to just to transform physical acti activity into charitable donations, mainly through yeah. running then other sports. But how has this platform evolved during time to include other forms of physical activities and also other features? Like what was the story? Because you've been doing it for, for a while now. Yeah, we've been doing it for 11 years, so it's evolved a lot. It, it was never just running. It was always walking, running, and biking, and really any activity that people wanted to do, we were open with that. We don't list all the activities that people we do. It just You can just use it, and it you know works like any kind of activity tracker. Um, the, the way that we've been evolving is really how do we think about our impact? So like I said, when I first started it, the way that I thought about our impact was that people would walk companies would advertise and we would then move that advertising money to the charities, you know, cents at a time. And that worked to a point, but it didn't scale. Like the companies don't give us an unlimited amount of money. So one, we could never give to our current charity partners as much money as we would want and have the impact for them that we would want. And, we also couldn't add any more charities to the app because there wasn't enough money to support them. Mm -hmm. So we just started to rethink what are the other ways that 
our community, the people who are walking, running, and biking for charity can make an impact for these causes? How is it that walking for a cause is impactful? And so we just started to like first understand what impact means differently, and then also try to incorporate that understanding into new features in the app. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, one of the, the most impactful things that you can do is to raise awareness for a charity. And so, you know, so many of the causes that we're, that we are trying to make an impact for like breast cancer, autism, wounded veterans, the environment, r rare diseases, raising awareness for those causes is, is very important. So empowering our members to share on social media and to tell their friends that they're walking for a particular charity is one of the ways that our members can make an impact. We also added peer-to-peer -peer fundraising where people can ask their friends and family to sponsor them so that it's not just depending on advertising money, but if someone is inclined, they can share it on social media and ask their friends to make a donation to the charity that they're supporting. And if people do that, they raise an average of $1.63 per mile. So you can actually make quite a big impact doing that. Uh, we also did made it so that charities can bring in their own corporate partners. So we're a platform for all the charities that want to join us to be able to attract and engage and provide value to the companies that they are either currently partnering with or want to partner with. And then we also added something called our employee empowerment program, which is something that allows companies to sponsor their employees because we had hundreds of companies always reaching out to us and wanting to do that. So now all of these kind of things can kind of come together into a way that people can turn their miles into impact for charity. With those charities, um, could you share a story about one or two that particularly impacted you or changed the way you view your work? Yeah, so I actually have two, maybe, two maybe more answers to that question. So that actually brings up what I think is actually the biggest impact that we have with Charity Miles. And that is the impact on ourselves. When nobody has to use Charity Miles, no, so all of the people that are using it have taken an extraordinary action. And anybody listening to this, I know that you know, the people that listen to your podcast are entrepreneurs in the health tech space. And they probably developed some kind of an app or a, a program or something. Everybody listening to this knows how hard it is to get somebody to use what you've built, right? Nobody has to use Charity Miles. We don't advertise it. We don't push it on anybody. So anybody that comes to us to use it, that's an extraordinary action that they're taking. I mean, it seems very easy and it is a very easy app to use, but somebody saying, I want to do this, that's extraordinary. And I want to do this for a cause. I want to do this for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. That's extraordinary. And the fact that, and also the people here also know not only how hard it is to get somebody to, to try your product, but to keep using it, how hard retention is. So the fact that somebody is saying that I want to use this and they keep doing it, mm -hmm. they, every time they do it, we're not sending them push notifications or anything like that. Like they're doing it. They are saying to themselves today, I am walking for Parkinson's disease, or I am walking for autism, or I am walking for the environment. And they're telling themselves a story about what they value. And mm -hmm. that story becomes part of their identity. And it influences, whether they know it or not, it influences so many of the other decisions that they make in their day. And I've experienced this personally. Um, you know, it changes what I eat for lunch. It changes how much sleep I get. It changes, you know, how I try to be present with my family. It's just sometimes unsuccessfully, but I try, but like, you know, it's, it just changes the way that we walk through life. And really, if we want to make an impact for these causes, we have to change the way that we walk through life. Raising money for them is not enough. We have to live differently mm -hmm. and when we start to see ourselves differently. When we start to make all these small and maybe big decisions in our life differently, that impact is going to be far greater than any amount of money that we raise for charity. So all of the charities that I've walked for and had the honor of working with have impacted me because it's become a part of my story. It's become a, it's become a lens through which I see the world. Um, and, you know, 
when I think about the, the hundreds of thousands of people that use charity miles and that happening with them to some degree in varying degrees, that is what excites me most about the impact. And, and you've raised uh, more, I mean, nearly $3 million for charities. Um, is that correct? It's been more than that. Um, I think it, we're more closer to 10 million. Okay. I don't count it. Um, you know, a lot of it's coming from companies to, for their employees. And, um, but I, I think it's either near or above 10 million. And mm -hmm. like, honestly, like that, you know, I thought I'm less focused on the money being raised and um, more on kind of the process and the experience and the journey and the story, because that's where I find it. I read this interesting um, recently, this past Martin Luther King Day, um, I was reading an, an, uh, an editorial in the newspaper and it talked about how Martin Luther King marched and he led the civil rights, mar he led the civil rights movement, but the civil rights marches and how those march, the, the act of marching was to one, tell a story was to make a statement to other people about the importance of civil rights. And that's mm -hmm. how I always understood what the marches were about. But what this editorial shared with me, which really resonated with me, is that uh, Martin Luther King saw that the, the, the most important part of the marches was the story that the people were telling themselves, that the marchers were telling themselves about their own power about their own dignity. And that really resonated with me. It's like all these people walking, telling themselves a story about what they value and how they're putting those values into action every day. That's really what excites me the most. Yeah, and every day they can walk or run for a different cause. You can, yeah, you can. I mean, most people kind of, most of our members I think have like one cause that they walk for, but or maybe, you know, two or three that they change up. But we have some members that change it all the time and, you know, choose a different one every day. Um, one of our members actually um, just passed away unexpectedly. And she was one of our most dedicated members. Her name is Alicia Adcock, uh, Lisa Adcock. She goes by Lisa. And she did over 50,000 charity miles. 50. Okay. Thousand, to be exact, 50,686 charity miles. That is enough to go around the world twice and then from New York to Milwaukee. That's an insane amount of charity miles. And she did it for lots of charity. She, you know, I looked at the, we just did a little, you know, remembrance of her on our, on our blog and our newsletter. And I was looking at all the charities she supported and it's like incredible. And, you know, when I look at that list of all the charities that she supported and what all of those miles meant to her, you know, she made a decision before every single one of those bike rides that she was doing it for a certain charity and, you know, what that meant to her and how that may have impacted her and impacted other people around her is just in That's, beyond yeah. words to me. There's also another one of our members um, ran. So we've had eight people run a, run or walk across the country. The first person that did it was a, a young woman named Anna Judd. Anna is an artist, uh, a painter in California. And she decided that she wanted to run across the country. She had been doing a little bit of, you know, running and she kind of built up to a, a little bit. But when she decided that she wanted to run across the country, she wanted to do it for veterans. And she specifically wanted to do it for veterans because she is a pacifist and she could not imagine what it would be like to go to war. And so she wanted to do this for veterans to put herself in the shoes of somebody that's gone to war. And mm -hmm. she said that this run, it wasn't a run. It was her performance art. And, you know, she was performing it to other people, the people that were following her journey, but she was performing it to herself. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, when that, when she, expressed that to me, I was just like, it started to just totally change the way that I think about charity miles. You get a lot of feedback from the, from the users. They, they write you, they. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I love my favorite thing. So, you know, we do, um, when people join the app, we send, I don't know if you've ever heard of the tool called video ask. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a great uh, tool by Typeform where 
you know, I can create a video and then ask people to send a video back. And so we send that out to new members and new members send me videos all the time. I get you know videos all day, every day from people telling me why they join the app. Mm -hmm. We always send them, I'll do roll calls with video ask where I'll just like send out a video like, Hey, sh show me where you're doing your charity model. People send them back. Mm -hmm. um, every Wednesday we do a new member zoom that people can join on Wednesday nights. And I get to, it's really part, you know, I say that it's, I'm doing it because I want to, you know, answer their questions about the app, which is what I do, but I just do it because I like to meet them. Um, uh, every other week or every week about, we do live walking meditations on Zoom that people join from around the world. We did one yesterday. Uh, we've got another one coming up tomorrow. The one yesterday, we had somebody in South Africa. We had somebody in Hawaii. We had somebody in Germany. And the person in Germany was doing it on a horse. Like, <laughs> like and and I get to like meet them and hear their stories. And it's just like, that's like the coolest thing. Yeah. Um, I've had people stay at my apartment and my house that have come to visit. Like if yeah. I go somewhere, I might stay on someone out. Like, you know, we're not Strava. We're not huge. I mean, we have a lot of people that use the app, but we're, you know, intimate enough where I get to, you know, yeah. have this connection with people. And, you know, and I know that we have a Facebook group where people are always posting and sharing their stuff and, you know, this woman who passed away, Alicia, or Lisa, as she goes by, she was a very active, I never met her in person, but I felt like I knew her because she posted to the Facebook group all the time, mm -hmm. photos from her rides. And she was also like one of the, always one of the first people to comment or like or celebrate somebody else's post. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like, and, you know, so, so she was like one of the leaders of this group. And like, I got, you know, I never met her in person, but I knew her. And, mm -hmm. um, and we, I could tell you stories, literally, I don't know how long you want this podcast to be. I could tell you stories all day about the people. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that. Story. Like, Very cool. not as, I know this is a, an app about like health tech, which <laughs> I kind of feel a little weird doing because we are the least sophisticated app. I don't even, I wouldn't even consider it tech. <laughs> like there's like almost no tech to what we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I know you're, you're community it's driven. All, it's all driven by the people in our community. Yeah. We won the Webby award for the best health and fitness app. There's like no, we won the people's choice of South by Southwest. There's like, we are so tech light. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's all, you know, just enough to like bring this community together and to, you know, empower these people to, you know, write their own story. Mm -hmm. But is it, I mean, of course, it's going to be community driven. And I see that you're, well, you wanted to stay that way. But what, what are the future plans for the for the organization? How do you envision the, the growth or you want to grow or not really? You want to focus on that? What, what's the big picture for that? I don't really know. I mean, I want to grow, but I don't, you know, like when I'm kind of like open to the universe to see like what opportunities is, is the universe bringing. And right now, the way I, the, what I really want is I want to be able to support all the charities that want to join us. And that's why we added the integration with the PayPal giving fund, because mm -hmm. it basically allows people to choose what almost any charity that they want. And walk for that charity and if they want to fundraise for that charity they can do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising where they ask their friends to sponsor them and then if those charities want they can reach out to us and we can give them the other services that we provide to them and i would really love to you know serve as many of these organizations as possible um and it doesn't take a lot like you don't need like hundreds of people or thousands of people walking for you as an organization to make an impact even if you had five people walking for you, that could be impactful. So I, I'd like to really, I'm trying to really understand better and think about more like how we can serve all the these charities that, that reach out to us so that we can really help them make a bigger impact on their mission. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned you're not that, let's say tech savvy, but you gave a sneak peek of, of a new app in the recent podcast uh, that you did. But could, could you share some more? Uh, could you share more about the project and how it will expand upon or differ from the charity miles? Mm -hmm. I think you're referring to walking meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
welcome meetings grew out of Chatterbox. It's also not very tech heavy. Um, it's a simple idea, which is welcome meetings. You know, we do like this. I could, you know, if it wasn't for like the needing to have good audio, I could probably do this on a walk. In fact, yeah. we have a podcast, the Charity Miles podcast. All of the interviews are done on a walk or a run, and we invite the listeners to walk or run with us. So, mm -hmm. um, walking meetings kind of grew out of Charity Miles in that we work with so many companies that come to Charity Miles because they're looking to improve employee well being. And the kind of the framework for most, the, the, the thing that they reach out to us to do most are the things that they call a step challenge. I'm not sure if the people here have heard of that, but it's a kind of a common thing for companies to do where they challenge their employees to do a certain number of steps and who can win. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned, and maybe this is something that, you know, people in your audience would appreciate from a behavior design perspective, I've been fortunate that uh, to know, to know BJ Fogg and to learn from BJ Fogg, who's kind of like one of the godfathers of like behavior design and tech. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of his kind of key tenets is if there's a behavior that you want to facilitate or encourage, or you want people to do, you want to make that behavior as easy as possible. So it kind of struck me that the whole idea of a challenge doesn't make sense because the word challenge means something hard. So when you go to your employees and you say, hey, I have a challenge for you, you're telling them you've got something hard for them to do. And so with Charity Miles, whenever a company comes to us and says that they want to do a challenge, we try to help them do it in a way where they don't call it a challenge. And that kind of just got me thinking about like, what are the other ways if they're looking to help their employees walk more, get some fresh air, get away from their computers, what are some other easy things that they can do to, to encourage that? And I personally like to do walking meetings. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe this is an easy way for companies to do it. So I just started talking about it with our, you know, the companies that we work with and they like the idea. And so now we're trying to think of like, how do we productize that mm -hmm. into something that could help companies make walking meetings part of their culture. And we have, a, you know, one of the things that we started with is we have an extension for Microsoft Outlook that basically just helps people schedule walking meetings. Just like, it's not very tech sophisticated. It's like a simple thing. Like, you know, when you're scheduling a meeting and if you think it could be walkable, schedule it as a walk meeting. And then, you know, you're setting that intention. So when the meeting comes, you're more likely to do it as a walk. Than yeah, but, yeah. but the idea is great. I mean, I think uh, a, lot, a lot of companies are looking to work to the you know, new ways of engaging or promoting the pro-health behaviors yeah. within the companies. Not only pro-health, but also mental health. Yeah, it's, it's really more about mental health than physical health because you're not going to get ripped by going for a walk. But um, you know, it's probably the, the best thing that you can do for your mental health is to get outside and get some fresh air, walk. You know, It's great for camaraderie with your colleagues. It's great for creativity. It's great for productivity. You know, just get away. Like today on my calendar, I'm like back to back meetings. I'm just like, oh God, I got to get at least one of these as a walk because if I'm just in my chair all day doing Zooms, I'm just going to go out of my mind. So mm -hmm. um, it's a really simple idea. And like, you know, with Charity Miles, I've just seen, you know, I didn't start this as like an employee engagement program, but we now work with hundreds of companies doing employee engagement. So I've learned about it and I see the market and I see all these very sophisticated and robust well-being programs that nobody uses, right? Like companies buy these things and they're very expensive and they have a ton of stuff, but none of the employees use them. Yeah. And actually, you know, going back to my days as a lawyer, we had it at our law firm. We had all sorts of well-being stuff on our, you know, intranet that nobody used, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, how can, and their companies are spending a lot on that. So I'm just thinking like, what's a, a simpler easier, less expensive way that companies can just make well-being a part of their culture. Yeah. And that's that's the idea behind what it's really very low tech. Yeah. <laughs> but in, a, in a sense, that's actually the obviously incentive drives behavior. And in your case, it can be the incentive is actually an impact you're 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 creating instead of just walking for uh, because the company says you can Right. I mean, that, I, I see that in that way. But you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned the, the issues and the mental health issues. And I know these 
are also important to you. So how how does this influence your work at Charity Miles and what kind of initiatives are you implementing to promote mental health through the platform? Yeah, this is another thing that I've kind of kind of learned it's through Charity Miles. Um, you know, when I started it, like, I never really thought that much about mental. I mean, personally, I did. Like, I've, um, I've personally struggled with depression and anxiety. I've been to counseling at different parts of my life. And, um, but it was never really so much of a public conversation. And it's becoming more of a public conversation now, which I think is a good thing because you need to, there's a lot of stigma around it. And so I try to be very open with it. Um, and we've had the fortune of working with some charities that are doing some great work to advance that conversation. One that we work with is called Active Minds, which is very important. Um, but something happened going back like four, four or five years now, um, around just, uh, like right before new year's, I was like, you know what, I wonder what our members are thinking about for their New Year's resolutions. And uh, so I sent a survey, I emailed a survey to our members and said, hey, you know, I'm curious, like what's your New Year's resolution? Um, and it was an anonymous survey. Now, my idea was I was just gonna like put together like a, a list of like everybody's New Year's resolution so that people could see it and that would be kind of a cool thing for our community. And um, one of the people wrote back that they're, and I don't know who it was, but one of the people wrote back that their resolution was to not hate themselves. Mm -hmm. And even like saying that, like, I'm like feeling it like right here, like, and that really hit me. And, you know, I thought to myself that if one person in our community is feeling that way, then other people in our community are probably feeling that way. We've got a lot of people in our community and, you know, you know, I don't know what the stats are, but a lot of people struggle with mental health issues, myself included. And so, you know, I decided to just share an email out with our, and also I wanted to reach that person and I couldn't reach that person individually because I didn't have their email mm -hmm. with an anonymous survey. So I wanted to send an email out to everybody saying like, Hey, I got this back. And I just want you to know that you can get help. Like here's a whole bunch of resources for mental, you know, mental health charities that have resources, hotlines, counseling, like it's important to get help and it's important to be open about it. And I shared my experience with the depression and anxiety. And also, by the way, um, I know I'm rambling here a little bit, but the yeah. people who are listening to this as founders likely are entrepreneurs in the health tech space, you know, entrepreneurs, mental, like we experience depression and anxiety a lot. And I, you know, it's something that, you know, it's a rough road that we're on. It's not easy. And I know that, you know, I've had depression and anxiety before being an entrepreneur, but being an entrepreneur, I think, triggers it and heightens it in many ways. And I have very, I have a lot of dark days. So for the people who are listening to this, if you are struggling with mental health, it's important and it's okay and it's good to get help. And there's a lot of resources out there. Um, counseling is important. There's now there's all sorts of like better help and like online counseling that you can get and, um, just medication is helpful. Going for a walk is helpful. Like there's a lot of help out there and, and I encourage everybody to not be afraid to get help. So anyway, I sent an email out sharing that and I can't, it's by, I've never gotten so many responses to an email that thousands of people that wrote back to me, how much that meant to them. Um, and so now it's become a very important part of our community is just being open and talking about mental health. Even if you're not walking for a mental health charity, we try to promote mental health, uh, not just during mental health month, but throughout the year. And one of the things that we started doing last year to do that is we do walking meditations, which I mentioned, and we do them either every week or every other week. This week we have two of them and just a mental health walk, go out for a walk, get some fresh air and get some, um, you know, clear your mind and get, feel good. Yeah. But it's all within this idea of, I mean, the concept of physical activity relates to mental health. It's important. So you support it in that way as well. As I understand yeah, it. You know, Austria, I was just reading an article last week, Australia just came out the country. Like, I don't know if it was a law or like a, whatever they said, they said that, um, 
physical activity is, should be the number one prescribed thing for mental health issues, for depression and things like that. I, I don't know. I can't remember exactly the article, so don't quote me on it or anything, but it was like for depression, physical activity should be prescribed before drugs. Mm -hmm. And I have mixed feelings on that because I think that some people need medication and they should get medication. Um, I also have mixed feelings on it because I'm, while I'm not personally on medication, I'm probably the most physically active person I know and I still have depression. So, mm -hmm. um, and when you are going through something like depression, when you're really feeling it, it's very hard to get, it's, it's easy to say, oh, well, you should just go for a run. But like some days I can't drag myself out of bed. So I have some mixed feelings about that, but physical activity does significantly help mental health. So absolutely. But I don't want to overstate it because there's a lot of other things that you need to do for your mental health too. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, activity, obviously as a healthy behavior, um, I agree that, that it helps. That's, 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 that's definitely true. But you also covered some of it. You mentioned that with companies trying to promote some behaviors within the comp within their own uh, structures and organizations. And you, you, you mentioned some challenges, but um, what would you say, except for, except for that, what, what are the biggest challenges in this, in this area? Um, I mean, the promotion of pro health attitude within the companies or, or even not within them, but, um, and, and like how, how obviously how, how your organization uh, is helping to overcome those. I think a lot of the stuff on the way that companies look at well being, maybe, I don't know if I would call this a challenge. Well, the, one of the challenges is that people are really busy, right? So they don't, people have a lot on their plate. They're yeah. busy with time, they're busy in their mind. So they don't need like another tool. They don't need something on their internet that they have to go to. They don't need more stuff to do. And they don't need another challenge, right? They need something easy. And um, so a lot of the way that I've come to kind of think about it is like, what is the company's culture? Like, how is this just woven into the culture and the routine of the company? And I actually think about the law firms that I used to work for. And this is going back, you know, a while now. Um, but at the time, like I was the only person that I knew at the law firm that ran. I'm sure other people did, but like people looked at me like I was crazy. Like the culture at the firm, it was a great firm to work, walk, work for. But like, you know, it was the type of culture where you worked at, until after midnight every night. You worked yeah. really hard. And like you would have dinner at the office and like people would, you know, I, there was one guy that I worked with and his nickname was Meatball because like he used to like try to see like how many meatball subs could he eat at dinner, right? Like, and how many Red Bulls could you drink to stay up all night? Like it was not a healthy culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that now like the people that I know who work at that firm and firms like it, they've dramatically changed their culture. Now everybody there is running in like a Tough Mudder or a Spartan race or a marathon or a 10K or a triathlon or doing yoga. It's just become more part of the culture. And so what we try to help companies with, and like I said before, is like when we try to help a company do what they're thinking of as a challenge without calling it a challenge, really what we're trying to help them do is to make well-being and giving back part of their culture, part of the story that they tell themselves about what they're about. You know, when I was at that law firm, like our story that we told ourselves is that we are you know, the biggest, baddest law firm, like we stay up, we work hard, we're, we're going we're gonna to pound 10 Red Bulls, we're going to eat three meatballs. So, like, that was our story. Like who, you know, that was our identity. Mm -hmm. Maybe not mine, but like, that was like the identity that oh. people had there. And like, you know, we, what we try to do is we try to help companies tell themselves a different story about what their values are and how they are living those values, exercising those values to use a pun every day. And, you know, I think that that's much more important than like, you know, a tool on your internet or like a program on your, on your internet or something like that. So that story again, changes the decisions that we make every day. It's going to change what you eat for lunch. It's going to change whether you decide to take a 10 minute walk break. It's going to, 
you know, change if you try to get go to bed early instead of watching, you know, two more reruns of Seinfeld at night. It's going to, you know, it's going to change all these decisions. And all of those things, it's like the little things that you do every day that are what fuel the well-being. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, do you also help those companies to actually make the organizational change and cultural change? Um, or you mean by just using the platform, they need to implement some of it? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do is with charity models is we try to help them make that cultural change, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's one way of doing it. I mean, we can't go into the cafeteria and change the food that they serve there. Yeah. Um, you know, we can, we, you know, we're pretty narrow in our scope, but a big part of our service is helping the companies tell a story. Mm -hmm. Why is it that they have a charity models team? What are their values? How are they, how is this an easy way for people to exercise those values every day and to tell that story repeatedly, mm -hmm. uh, to tell that story over time, to celebrate the impact that they're having, to celebrate the people who are participating. And the more you do that, the more you tell that story, the more you celebrate, the more it becomes part of your culture, the more it becomes part of, you know, the way that you see yourself and impacts all the other decisions you make. So that's like a big part. Our service is like the app is really simple. Mm -hmm. The service that we provide is the storytelling that goes along with the app. And at the beginning, you said you're a marathon, uh, and as as a and also a tri triathlete, right? And uh, I haven't done triathlons in a while. My colleague Nicole is a very active triathlete. She's okay, a seven Ironman, I think maybe twelve. Uh, I still, you still, you still, do, I mean, you still do it. You still run. You still. Oh. I still run, but I don't cycle oh. or um, I don't do triathlons anymore. And what, what, what was the most uh, memorable race that you did and why it, it stands out, you know? Um, my favorite marathon that I ever did is the Mount Desert Island Marathon in Maine. Uh, it's a beautiful race. It's in like October, beautiful fall foliage. It's a small race and it's just like the most perfect weather. It's kind of cold and you know, the leaves are changing colors and you're over the Bar Harbor and it's just absolutely spectacular. Um, that's my favorite. Every one of them has like a different story. I I can't say that one is more memorable yeah. than the other. I mean, some are memorable because I suffered a lot and some are memorable because I ran fast. Some are memorable because I ran with a person. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, how long do you have? I can tell you stories. I've run, you know, I did... Um, we have time. I did the 2012 Ironman. Uh, so actually, so 2012, I did the New York City Ironman as a guide for a, a blind athlete named Jack Chen. That was okay. incredible. And, you know, it was the only time that they had the Ironman in New York City. It wasn't really in New York. It finished in New York City, but most of it was in New Jersey. Swam uh -huh. in the river, biked up 9W, which is like a road that goes to New Jersey, to New York State, and then ran over the George Washington Bridge into the city. And it was in July. It was so hot. It was 2012. So I just started Charity Miles. It was so hot. And I totally and I totally blacked out. Like I was on the run, I was blacked out. And I don't, there was like, I don't even remember large parts of it. But Jack, who's blind, like guided me through the run. Uh, <laughs> it just, it was literally like the blind leading the blind. And he's an incredible person and having the opportunity to share that experience and the training with him. And so that, you know, to count him as a friend and a person in my life is incredible. The New York, in uh, 2017, I did the New York City Marathon as a guide um, for a young woman uh, who has, Justine Galloway, who has um, something called runner's dystonia. So she was a runner in college and she developed something called runner's dystonia, which actually there's a, a very famous runner who actually just got a Kara Goucher. And basically it, it, it's kind of like, dystonia is kind of like Parkinson's in a way, but mm -hmm. what she has is um, she can't run forwards. Like mm -hmm. for whatever reason, when she tries to run forward, she like trips and falls. Her, her brain isn't like sending the signal to her legs right. So she somehow figured out that she could run backwards. So she runs backwards. And I got to guide her through the New York City Marathon. So basically, she's running backwards, and I'm like running forwards, and I'm like right here, like yeah, looking just in her face. 
for 26 miles. And I'm just going like, if, if she needs, I'm just like kind of pointing, like she's got to go this way or that way and what, you know, to avoid it. And New York City Marathon is very crowded. So there's a lot of people and there's a lot going on. So there's a lot of guiding. And it was so, you know, I had to be so mindful because like she can't see what's going on behind her. So I had to like, and I'm like right here, I have not looked at my wife for that long. It, like, it, like, it was like dancing with somebody for six hours. And amazing. I, I think that's by far my favorite marathon that I've ever run. If I'm thinking about it now, like that was just the most unbelievable experience. So I'd say like the, you know, the, the really memorable ones are the ones that I share with somebody uh -huh. and, and I get to kind of, like there's like that story, like I said, it's a story that kind of gets me right. So like that experience, sharing that experience, literally, that's like the most. It's probably like the most intimate mm -hmm. with my wife that I've ever been with anybody. Yeah, but it's an, just an incredible thing to share. Same thing with Jack. Like, <laughs> you know, when you're doing that with him and he's visually impaired, and like our bodies are moving together that way, and like it's just a very intimate, incredible experience to share that with somebody and to share that story with somebody. No, that's amazing. I mean, we had a few athletes here in the podcast and a few entrepreneurs that were ex-athletes. And that these were the two most inspiring stories I have ever had when it comes to marathon or triathlon. Seriously, that's, that's seriously inspiring. And by the way, was it like a full Ironman? Yeah, full Ironman. Okay, Jesus. Actually, that's, that's, that's I trained for two with him. The first one I trained for him was 2010, the Florida Ironman. And I had a bike accident two weeks before and I broke my pelvis. So I wasn't able to do it with him, but I was able, I was able to do it. Um, we were able to get a waiver because the rules of Ironman say that you have to have one guide for the whole race. You can't have a different guide for each discipline, but given the circumstances, they allowed it so that I guided him in the swim, another friend guided him in the bike and another friend guided him in the run uh, for 2010. And then 2012, we did the New York city Ironman together me and him the whole way. Um, and that's a long day to share with somebody. <laughs> uh, yes. it's, yeah. and for all the training, like it's doing a tandem bike with somebody, it, you know, that's a very, there's a lot of trust, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, ste we're going 20, 25, 30 miles an hour and I'm steering this thing. You know, he's, he's got his life in my hands. <laughs> like that's a big responsibility. Um, and it's, an, it's just, an, and you know, you go on long rides together and you talk and really special. Because my, my, my dream is to just finish an Ironman and you just did it like as a guide for someone, which is, and for a visually impaired person, which is even more impressive. But anyway, yeah, we are. I have a podcast that I did with Jack and I have a podcast that I did with Justine and I can send you the links to those if you want to include those in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, we will. We'll definitely put them in the, in the link. That's, 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 that's great. Um, we always ask this as well. Um, closer to, to towards the the end of the of the of each episode, so we always ask uh, our guests uh, for um, for advices. I know it's hard usually, but if if you were to um, to give yourself three advices at the beginning of your career, what would they be? There's a lot. I've made so many mistakes. It's like hard to choose which one to. <laughs> <laughs> Probably us. Yeah. That's why it's, that's why we always have this question because it's just very interesting per per personality in the in the in the episode. One would be sell before you buy, or sell sell before you build. Mm -hmm. So one mistake that I've made a lot of times, and I continue to make it, but I try not to as much anymore, is spending a lot of effort and time and money building something, thinking that people will buy it, and or people will use it, and actually more importantly that people will buy it. Um, you can go broke very fast doing that. And um, so I would always kind of, and actually going back to my days as a lawyer, I was a real estate lawyer uh, primarily. I did also corporate finance, m and But like a lot of times these developers, real estate developers, they kind of pre-lease the building. They like go out and they say, okay, I'm going to, if I'm going to build a building here, can I get a tenant? And they go and they get the tenant and then they, they know they have the tenant, then they decide to go buy the land and build the building. Like they, they totally, they sell it before they buy it. Um, and so it's kind of the same thing with this tech. Like if you can sell it and get a client and 
kind of like pretending, not in like a manipulative or misleading way, but like, this is the product that we're going to yeah. build. Do you want to buy it? And then you build it for them is a much better way than building on spec and thinking that somebody's going to buy it. Um, another thing that I would say is um, save money, like cut your burn, be as lean as possible. Um, and then another thing that I would say is really love your customers and your users. Like mm -hmm. really like that's like the, that's our, to the extent that we have any success, and I think this has probably come through. It's not because it's despite all of the mistakes that I've made, <laughs> it's just like, so yeah. it's really be, through our, you, our community, our members and our clients and our partners and the, it's that's what's driving the train and i just have to like attach myself to that as mm -hmm. much as possible so it's not about your vision it's about how do you help actually so this comes from bj fogg for from behavior design the way that he says it is don't try to get somebody to do what you want them to do if you're designing for behavior find something that people already want to do and help them be successful at it so kind of in the way that I understand is like the, the people that are using charity models, the partners that we work with, the charities that we work with, how do I help them be successful at what they already want to be successful at rather than trying to get them to do something else that I might want them to do. After this hour with you, I see that you actually love it. I mean, not only the companies, not only the users, but the organization and then the lifestyle that just proves that that's, that's amazing. And thanks. Thanks for joining us today and for sharing all of that because this is truly inspirational. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share. And anybody out there would like to join us, charitymiles.org, where you can just go to the app store and uh, type in charity. It'll probably be the first thing that comes up. Stay in touch with us, subscribe to our podcast, give us a like, comment, or share. If you want to reach out personally, you can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram.